let's just pray. God, we thank you so much for everything that you've done for us, and we ask that you would oh, encourage us to be faithful to you, and we thank you for your faithfulness. You are our God. You are our King. Amen. Please stand. Water you turned into wine. stand if you want to. It doesn't really matter. Welcome. So glad that you're here this morning to be together as the family of God, to hear God's word, to sing together, and then this morning to come and be at the table together. Just a few things that are highlighted in your announcements for this morning. Just remember that July 8th, the end of this week, is men's ministry. Um, and then in a week from Saturday, we're doing a, another summer soul connection here at church, uh, having a um, tailgate party um, out in the front. So bring your own food and drink and just a time of socializing and fun and any long games you want to bring along, you can do that. And then in the, on the 13th, for those 55 plus, there's a time of coffee and muffins together. So you can see that. And then... Pastor Karen and I have been writing devotionals for each month, and July begins to, uh, this week to talk about what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself, and we decided as we put this week together, this month together, that in order to love your neighbor as yourself, you need to love yourself as well. And so this month is, how can you do that? How can you help to give space for yourself so that you have the energy and resources you need to love others as God has loved you? I think this morning it would be great if we could all just stand and, and greet one another and say hi and welcome to worship. Wow, that's, that's been a long time. <laughs> oh, wow. You're not wearing a matching shirt today. You and Alan aren't matching today. I'm surprised he's not playing.
play or play. <laughs> can start now.
you, God, for all the blessings that you have poured into our life. Especially on this weekend, we think of family and friends and the freedom we have to worship together as your people. And so, God, in response to all that we have been blessed with, we give you back to you these gifts and know that you will bless them to this use of this faith community as well as into the community in which we find ourselves. God, you are a good God, and you give us all your good gifts, and we give you thanks. In your name we pray. Amen.
to be in your presence. Prepare our hearts, Lord, right now as we wait to listen to your words. Speak to us. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, you're not sitting. You're seated already. Kids here, you want to come up and be on the steps with me? Oh, no, it's on me. Excellent. Come on, you guys. Come on down. Come on down. Find your way down here to the stairs. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come down and sit on the steps with me. Or on the floor, however you want to do it. Hey, guys, so glad you're here. Do you guys know what this is? Yeah. Have you ever used one of these Advent calendars before? Why do we use an Advent calendar? Yes, right, because we're waiting for Jesus to come at Christmas, right? And so every day that we open up a door, it's one more day closer until Christmas comes again. And this morning in the Bible that we're going to, the passage we're going to read, we talk about Jesus coming again. And Jesus says we need to be ready, that we need to prepare ourselves for his coming. But he says there's not an Advent calendar we can use to prepare that there's some other ways that we can do that. And Jesus tells us we have to be ready when he comes. Do you know that Jesus is coming again? Have you heard that before? No. Yeah. Jesus came once as a baby, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas. But Jesus said after he left this earth, he says, I'm coming back again someday. But he didn't give us a day or a time when he's coming back, and he didn't give us a calendar to say, count down these days, and then I'm coming back. But Jesus said this, he says, be ready and be prepared for when I come. How do you think we can do that? How can we be prepared and ready for something that we don't even know when it's going to happen? Well, but we can have an advent calendar in our heart, meaning we can prepare ourselves for... I know, so I'll lay it down. So we can have an Advent calendar like preparing ourselves without an Advent calendar for Jesus, which means that we are the kinds of people that Jesus wants us to be like, loving our neighbors, taking care of people who maybe need some help, obeying our parents. Yikes. That's sometimes hard to do. But Jesus says this. He says, no one knows when that day or time will come only the Father knows, so always be ready. And we can do that by doing the things that Jesus wants us to do. So we don't need a calendar, an Advent calendar, to tell us when Jesus is coming. We just need to be ready and prepare ourselves. But I thought this morning it would be fun if we used my old Advent calendar and opened one of the windows for you that you could do this morning. So let's tell me your day or your birthday. What day are you born on? Do you know? It's on the 12th. There's a 12. There's a 12 right there. So there's your thing. Do you know what day, what day your birthday is? Mom, what day is her birthday? The 20. Oh, I got. Oh, so we don't have one of those. But we'll do. We'll do the 7th. This is a really hard advent calendar because they're not in order. I'll just give you a 3. I don't know. It was super confusing to me, David. What's your day of your birthday? 20. I don't have a 28 either, right? So we'll give you, oh, there's nothing in that one. I'll give you this one. What's your day? I got a 14. Somewhere. 
This is super hard. There's a... Oops. David, when's your birthday? Oh, I got one of those. There you go. How about you, Evelyn? What's your day or your birthday? Eighth. I got one of those too. There you go. And what's the day of your birthday? Oh, you're after birthday. I'll give you the closest one to that, to 25th. Can we find it? This is so hard. I'll give you the 24th. That's the closest we can do. There you go. Okay, before you go back and as you're sucking on your candy, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you love us very much. And we look forward to the day when you will come again so that we can see you and so that we can be with you. We pray that you will help us do all the right things as we wait for your coming. In your name we pray, amen. So if you're in preschool, you can go to um, Treehouse. I think Pastor Matt will lead you out. Okay, enjoy. You guys can go with Pastor Matt in the back there. Our text for this morning from Matthew 24 is a text that we usually use on, um, as part of the Advent season. In fact, it's the first Sunday in Advent reading um, in the church calendar. And so on that first Sunday of Advent, if you think back to December, that first Sunday in Advent, man, doesn't Christmas seem like an awful long way away? Well, from now it does, but the first of December, usually when it comes, sometimes that first Sunday in Advent is the last Sunday in November, and it seems like we have all this time to prepare to get ready for the 25th. But inevitably, I don't know if this is true for you, but it's true for me, that Christmas always sneaks up on me. And even when I know when in the season of Advent we're preparing and every Sunday we get that much closer, but I see all of a sudden it seems Christmas is there. But the crazy thing is the day of Christmas never changes, right? Christmas is always on December 25th. So it shouldn't be too big of a surprise when Christmas comes because we can look at the calendar. And just in case we forget what day Christmas is, there's all kinds of advertisers and stores that remind us, even in October, when Christmas is and how we need to prepare. And one way to prepare is having an advent calendar. This last year, I think I told you in December, I got an olive oil and vinegar advent calendar for evolution the store in in calgary that sells that and it was so fun opening my little drawer every day to see what little bottle of of um oil or vinegar or even salt that i got it helped me prepare to count down to the big day And, and advent calendars do that for kids for adults it helps us count down to christmas but sometimes the calendar can work against us as we prepare for christmas day we think we have all this time to do everything that needs to be done, but before we know it, Christmas comes. But if you think about it, if we didn't have calendars, if we didn't know what day it was, we knew Christmas was one day during the year, but we didn't know when it was coming, it would always be Christmas prep all the time. We would always be waiting for Christmas. We would always be preparing for Christmas, never knowing when it was coming. And it would be exhausting always to be in preparation mode. Well, all this talk about Advent calendars and Christmas as a purpose and that it helps us answer the question that somebody submitted that said, what are we to think about Jesus' second coming? So I want to look at, to answer that question by looking at Matthew 24 this morning to help us answer that. Jesus' words at the beginning of this chapter and really all of the chapter, is part of this longer passage called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus has come to Jerusalem for this last week of his life, and he has spent a lot of time of that last week teaching in the temple in Jerusalem. 
And as Jesus leaves this massive structure with his disciples, he asks them a question, and then he makes a kind of unexpected comment. He says, do you see all these buildings? And I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on another. Every stone will be thrown down to the ground. Now Jesus is anticipating something that not even Matthew or the rest of the disciples will know about, but what he's anticipating and what he's speaking about is when the temple will be destroyed in AD 70. So about 40 years in the future, the Romans will actually destroy the temple once and for all. But the disciples don't know that. All they know is that they've seen this temple in its current form, which really was a replacement temple, right? Because the first temple built by Solomon, was destroyed when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem and knocked everything in the city to, and made everything in the city a ruin. But Ezra and Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem after the exile, and they rebuilt the temple, and that's the one that was standing when Jesus and the disciples hear these comments. So they're gazing at this massive structure that looks eternally permanent because of how it's built, and Jesus' words to the disciples would have been really confusing. How could this temple, this massive structure, where God dwelt with his people, how could that place be destroyed? But before answering his question, Jesus takes his disciples away from Jerusalem and across the Kidron Valley, and they go up to the Mount of Olives, and they sit together, and Jesus begins to share with them what it's going to look like at a time in the future that they need to watch for. He says this, tell us when all these things happen and what will be the sign that it is time for you to come again and for this age to end. And Jesus answered them, be careful that no one fools you. And then Jesus proceeds then in these next verses to talk about what the end of the age is going to look like. Now, since the beginning of the church, there has been much discussion about what the end of the age will look like, when it will happen, and, and how Christians should respond to those end-of-age events. Now, I don't have the time this morning to go through all of the theories that people have put out there for what the end of the age will look like, but suffice it, suffice it to say that the Christian community have not been unified on how they understand what Jesus is going to do when he returns and what it will look like and when it will happen and, and when it will be ushered in. But what Christians can agree on is that, yes, Jesus is coming again. Now keep in mind, Jesus' words here in Matthew are not written to bolster a certain group's um, theory of the second coming. Jesus' words really have one purpose, to help his disciples, to help the larger church prepare for when Jesus comes again. In fact, being ready is the common theme that threads its way through these last chapters of Matthew. So I want to look at Paul's, uh, Jesus' words this morning to see if it helps us understand and answer the question on what we need to know about the end of the age. First, Jesus says in verse uh, 36, No one knows the day or time will be, not the angels in heaven, not even the Son, only the Father knows. So Jesus is saying that the end of the age, the time of that, the, the way in which that will happen is secret. And since, I, as I said, since the days, early days of Christianity, there have been those who claim to know exactly when Jesus is coming again. They have named a day, they have named a year, and um, thinking that they have a corner on this secret knowledge that Jesus says no one will know. And the funny thing is, I guess, is that we're all still here. So all of them who've made these estimates over time have all been wrong. Because Jesus said, no one knows that except the Father in heaven. And so no one knows, not even the angels. And, and interestingly enough, that not even he, Jesus himself knows the day or the hour or the year of his return. Only God knows. And that may sound odd to us because isn't Jesus the Son of God? And don't they talk to each other? And shouldn't they know that similar information? But if we read Philippians 2 especially, we read that Jesus emptied himself 
of his divinity to become human. And so, and he came to do his father's will. And so whatever uh, reason, Jesus emptied himself of his divine knowing. And it wasn't his father's will to know, for him to know that part of God's eternal plan. And so that's why he could say, not even himself, the angels or he himself does not know the day or the time of when he will come again. And the timing of the end of the age is secret because like getting ready for Christmas, if we knew the exact hour or day or year of his coming, what would we do? Would we be in readiness, really? Or would we procrastinate? Because don't we do that already? We know what Christmas Day is. It's the same day every single year for as long as we've been alive. But every single year, we procrastinate, preparing and getting ready for Christmas. And I think Jesus knows that we would do the same thing. And so the, that time frame of his coming is kept secret so that we can prepare ourselves and be ready even at the 11th hour. The timing is unknown so that we have this life, we live this life of watchfulness and readiness and preparation. And we are called to live as Jesus' coming could come at any time, so we need to be ready for whenever that day or time happens. And then Jesus goes on. When the Son of Man comes, it will be like what happened during Noah's time, in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving their children to be married until the day Noah entered the boat. They knew nothing about what was happening until the flood came and destroyed them. It will be the same when the Son of Man comes. So Jesus also says not only is it secret, the knowledge of when the end of the age will come, but it probably will surprise us when it does come. Now, I've never had a surprise birthday party my birthday parties have always been planned. Of course, I always know what day it is, so that's not surprising. But I like to plan for who's coming, what we're going to eat, the kind of cake we're going to have. That's always very important. And I'm not sure how I would handle having a surprise party because I'm a little bit of a control freak, and I like to have all those details kind of laid out ahead of time. But Jesus tells his disciples that his coming will be like a surprise party, but not in a good way. To communicate this reality, Jesus tells them and reminds them about Noah's story, because they would have known it. Because in Genesis 6, we read this, that God regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and so the writer of Genesis tells us that Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the, pe the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. God chose blameless, faithful Noah to build an ark to save his family, and this ark would become God's rescue operation for the world. And Jesus uses Noah's story to communicate to the disciples that the surprise that is in store for those waiting for his second coming. Jesus will be, his return will be like the day the floodwaters covered the earth. The people in Noah's day were, were eating and drinking and marrying and giving their children to be married, Jesus says. In other words, they were living their lives. They didn't see the signs. They seemed to ignore the fact that there was this huge big art being built in their backyard. There had to be a purpose for that. And yet, it, nothing seemed to penetrate their mind that something was coming. Noah evidently was preparing for this whatever was coming. But they ignored the signs. They ignored Noah. Probably, we don't read that in the text, but I'm sure people asked him, what in the world are you building in your backyard? And I'm sure Noah told them what was coming. But they seemed to ignore that. And they weren't concerned with what was going to happen, this big, terrible event that was about to come upon them. They just went on with their lives. Now, so that when the floodgates came and they opened, there was no warning signs, there was no signals from the sky. It just 
happened, and the water began to flow everywhere. So by the time the floodwaters began to rise, it was too late to do anything about it. Now, I want you to hear that when Jesus says that the, the people in Noah's day were eating and drinking and marrying and marrying and having children, that is not bad. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying that we are, can be caught up so much in the routines of daily life that we neglect the signs the, and can neglect our spiritual lives in the process. We might be surprised that when the signs begin to come that we are caught off guard when the end of the age arrives. So Jesus doesn't want his followers to miss out on what God is doing like those in Noah's day did. So when Jesus comes again, yes, it will be a surprise, but remember, yes, we don't know the day or the hour, so we need to be ready. We need to be doing the will of God like Noah was doing. So we won't be surprised when the end comes. And then Jesus goes on and gives another image that helps us understand the end of the age. He said, two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding grain with a mill, one will be taken and the other will be left. So the end of the age also, it seems to me, will be a separating time. There is wonder and excitement when Christmas comes, right? Especially after all the preparations have been completed and where homes and our lives are now ready for this special day. And then the same day, in the same way when Jesus comes, there will be wonder and excitement that all of the ways in which we have prepared ourselves, have lived for Jesus, they will all come together as we anticipate and look forward to being with him for all of eternity. And C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle, the last book in his Chronicles of Narnia, all of the animals of Narnia, the talking animals, of course, are all gathered with the kids that have been present in all of the books. And they're gathered together, and this battle has been won, and it looks very closely that Narnia as they know it is coming to an end. And as they look around, they realize that they're on the edge of what has been called Aslan's country. It looks very similar to where they have been in Narnia. And one of the characters sees Aslan country and he says this, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all of my life. I thought I knew, never knew it till now, but so as, as Aslan tells them, come further up and come further in. See, when Jesus comes again, he will take his followers to the place where they will fully be at home in the presence of God. But his coming will also be a time of, of judgment, a time of separation for those who are not going to Aslan's country. And this is what Jesus means when he tells the stories about people out in the field and people grinding grain where one is staying and the other is taken. Now we can have discussion about this, but I don't think this is what Jesus is talking about the rapture here. And you might disagree with me and we can have an, a discussion about that later. I think that the idea that faithful Christians will be taken up to their, earthly, their heavenly reward and the unfaithful left behind to face their hellish fate is not something that even Jesus mentions or even the epistles mention. Because the idea of a rapture is an idea that came to prominence in the mid-1800s. And it was connected to an end times understanding that was about millennialism and dispensationalism and the tribulation, things that are too complicated for me to get into this morning, but we can have a conversation about that. But to suffice, suffice it to say that when Jesus wanted his disciples to understand by giving these examples of someone in the field working and women grinding grain and one was taken and one was left, it was a time he wants them to know that his coming, the end of the age, is about a time of separation. And he talks about this more in Matthew 25. 
there will be a time of separation at the end of the age where there will be a time of judgment. And so his followers need to be prepared. They need to be ready. They need to be following Jesus every day. And then Jesus wraps up this particular part of looking at the end of the age with these words. So always be ready because you don't know the day your Lord will come. Remember this, if the owner of the house knew what time of night a thief was coming, the owner would watch and not let the thief break in. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at a time you don't expect him. So the end of the age will be secret. It will come as a surprise. It will be a time of separation. But Jesus assures us that we can be ready for that day. There are people in this world who prepare for Christmas all year long. And I used to be like that. I used to be on the lookout for gifts to give to my family. But whenever I was in a store or at a craft fair or something, I was always looking for things to get for my family. And I would buy them and I would add them to my gift stash so that when it came to December, I would be able to have my presents ready. But I don't do that anymore because my family is growing and changing and I, it just seems not to work for me to buy gifts in that same way. But Jesus tells us in these verses that we do need to be ready for his coming. But he doesn't tell us how specifically to get ready. That's why he tells these parables in the next chapters. He talks about the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats to remind us that Jesus' return is coming and there's ways in which we can prepare ways in which we can ready ourselves for the, com the end, for the coming of the end of the age. And we do this by seeking first the kingdom of God in all aspects of our lives. And if we do that, then we can be ready, and then we are preparing ourselves for when Jesus comes at the end of the age. Jesus' second coming is not some abstract doctrine with no bearing on our lived Christian life. As we read about how Jesus talks about the end of the age, we are called to mark our lives by waiting for that day, by living for Jesus, not by sitting around and thinking, well, at the very last minute, I'll do what I need to do. Jesus wants us to live every moment of every day in anticipation that his coming could happen at any time. He doesn't want us to obsess over the details of what the coming of the end of the age will look like, trying to parse the signs in the world that we see or events that are happening as somehow um, a way of saying, oh, the end is near. I don't think Jesus wants us to obsess in that way, but he wants us to get on with living as kingdom people now and in every day that is to come. We are to be salt and light. We are to love God and love our neighbors. We are to be Jesus followers in every corner of the world each and every day. So Jesus wants us to say, live your life every day as if I am coming back today. And plan and live as though Jesus is not coming back for a hundred years. It shouldn't matter when Jesus is coming back, we shouldn't obsess about what is happening in the world as if it's pointing to the end. We should live in anticipation of the end every single day. And how we treat each other, how we live our lives, how we speak, and how we just are in the world. We should be Jesus' followers every hour of every day, of every month of the year. We should be that kind of people and we do that and have that kind of mindset that we don't have to worry about when Jesus is coming again or when the end of the age is going to happen. We will be ready if we are living for Jesus every day. It's as simple as that. And so we can say as we have sung this morning and as the saints have said down through the ages, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.
One of the things we anticipate, I believe, when we come to the table is the wonderful eternal feast that we will share together as the people of God. The Lamb's High Feast, when we will gather together in heaven with all people down through the ages, from every nation and peoples on the earth, will gather together at the table um, in heaven and share together um, in the presence of God. I think every time we come to this table, we, we get a taste of what it's going to be like at that time when the end of the age happens and when all things end and we will be able to be with Jesus forever and worship God forever with all peoples um, of all times. I, I get excited about that when I come to the table because it's just this taste of what will be someday. Tomorrow maybe or 100 years from now, we do not know. But we are invited to come as God's people and get a taste of what our future will be. Because, friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west and north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. And this is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who have put their trust in him to share the feast that he has prepared. According to Luke, when our risen Christ was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it, and he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And so that's part of our time as we come together to the table, is to recognize God and, and Jesus anew as we take these elements and recognize who we are and who we still need to be as followers of Jesus Christ. There's a confession of sin up on the screen. Let's say that together as our prayer of confession this morning as we come to the table. Merciful God, we long for and need the presence of Christ in our lives. But we confess that we are too distracted to notice when it arrives. We long for peace, but confess that we will not be still long enough to greet it. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive our misplaced priorities that crowd you out of our hearts and our lives. Renew in us a desire for you above all else. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. So here's the good news. That God hears our prayers. He responds to our confession of sin with compassion and mercy. Enter Christ's joy as precious and forgiven children of God. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather at your table this morning, we shed all pretense about who we are. We know we are sinners. We know we often fail in life, at work, at school, in our relationships, in our values, in our faith. But Jesus, we remember that you reached out to Peter after he had denied you, and you brought him back. Remind us that we too, even though we have sinned against you, that we are not far and can be brought back into relationship with you. Teach us how to see your presence as we gather at your table. Give us thankful hearts for the mystery of this food and what it means to our faith. Send your Holy Spirit upon us to illuminate the way we should think and believe and walk after we have eaten and drunk these important elements that give us courage to live our faith in new ways and bind us together in the fellowship of your love from this moment forth and forevermore. Amen. Here are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they were offered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body 
which is broken for you. And then after supper, he gave thanks. And he took the cup and he poured it and he said, this cup is the new covenant of forgiveness in my name. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This morning, as we gather to receive these gifts, we'll have a station here in the front and a station here in the front. And you're welcome to come up at your own time to receive the gifts um, that God has given to us. The feast has been laid. Let us enjoy these gifts God has given to us.
and receive God's blessing. Jesus is coming again, so be ready and get prepared because we don't know the day or the hour, but we know he is coming. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? 